and we're back. Okay, so last time we talked about some of the core concepts of Dominions 5, and we talked about unit stat screen and what they do and all that. But in this video, we're going to be talking about magic, which is the defining factor of Dominions 5. Magic is what makes this game so good. The magic system in Dominions 5 is completely nuts. It's There's nothing in any other game that comes anywhere close to the kind of crazy shit that you can do in this game. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to approach trying to describe to you the kind of crazy shit that you can do with magic in this game. You can freeze entire oceans you can imprison the sun you can summon tarasks you can gift tarasks or any other random crazy monster that you have with sentience and sometimes that will make the magic users themselves and then all of a sudden you have crazy tarasks that's casting nature magic or you can open gates into the underworld and summon just like basically unleash the imprisoned primordial titans who are all who are all undead they died thousands of years ago and they've all gone completely insane because they've been in hell for like the past like several millennia so they're all completely nuts which makes them not very good commanders and difficult to control but you can use other kinds of magic or magic items or blesses or anything like that to heal their insanity and when the titans are healed of their insanity, they regain their magic powers. And now you've got these giant undead titans that are also incredibly powerful mages in their own right. And you can have them start doing shit. You can, you can call down fire and brimstone to smite entire armies from hundreds of miles away. Just like literal wizards standing at the top of their wizard towers, performing rituals to like... You know, cause crazy snowstorms to freeze enemy armies to death. Or have massive tidal waves destroy coastal provinces. You, you can... It's fucking crazy. It's insane. The, the stuff you can do is awesome. You can mind control your entire enemy ar enemy's army. And now all of them... All of those things you just mind controlled, they work for you now. It's not like a temporary thing. They literally belong to you. You can use them in your armies after that battle if they survive. It's it's nuts. You can <laughs> Okay. Let's uh I'm getting I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay. <clears throat> let's talk about what I was going to describe at the end of the last video. Research. Uh, this is the Pretender design screen. Uh, we're not going to get into this yet. Um, so, research. What does research do in Dominions 5? In Dominions 5, um, the, the, uh, the magic paths that your uh, mages have determines the amount of research points that they get. And then you assign which school of magic that you want to research. So, say you want to research Conjuration, then uh, you'll, you'll set all of your mages to research, and then you'll go into the research screen and click, I want to level Conjuration to level 3. And your points will be allocated to Conjuration every turn, and you'll slowly level up. So you see these levels here? So you go from level 1 to 2 to 3, and it goes all the way to level 9, where you can do the crazy stuff, like... Uh, <laughs> awaken Tarask. I wasn't joking. You can you can summon Tarasks, and this is Tartarian Gate, that thing that I told you about, where you summon the imprisoned Titans. Yeah, I I'm not joking about this stuff. You could do this. Uh, you could. Anyway, okay. So every school of magic goes from level one to nine, and if you're familiar with D and with Dungeons and Dragons, you might recognize a few of these. So Conjuration is summoning things. Uh, there are a few other special things that it can do, but mostly you are summoning creatures that will serve you. And Evocation 
is all about attacking spells for the most part. Like you're sending out bolts of energy and stuff like magma eruption, astral fires, murdering winter, acid storm, you know, just offensive spells, stuff like that. Now you'll notice these icons on the side here. These are the magic paths that are required to cast this spell. <clears throat> so if you wanted to cast Acid Bolt, for example, you would need to have researched Evocation up to level 3, and then you would need a mage that has Water Magic level 2 and Fire Magic level 1, and then that mage could cast Acid Bolt. And it has a bunch of stats here. So we can see it has a range of 35, which is, you know, that's how far it can it can go. And uh, casting time 100%, that means it takes one uh, turn to cast. Uh, area of effect, one, that means it hits one entire grid square. And if, uh, if you recall, um, I said that three humans, human-sized things can fit into one grid square. So if you're lucky, this will hit three people. Uh, precision is how accurate it is. Um, fatigue cost. This is how much fatigue that your caster gains when they cast this spell. Now, if you have higher paths than what is required, so if you're like water magic level 3, then the fatigue cost is halved, and it keeps getting halved for every more that you exceed the required level. So, and damage... It deals 20 damage, and this plus here means that if you have higher level magic, then it will scale, it'll do more damage. So you'd say, it says at the bottom there, damage is increased by two for every extra level the caster is. And it's magic damage, and it's acid damage, and armor piercing. Now armor piercing damage means that it ignores half of the enemy's protection, which is really strong. Uh, armor piercing is very good. It cannot be cast underwater, extra effect, area rust. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. I picked a bad spell. This does lots of weird, complicated stuff. Anyway, that's how magic spells work. And uh, you see these little symbols here? That means it's a ritual spell. That means it's cast on the campaign map. Uh, the ones without that are combat spells, which are cast in combat. And... Uh, yeah, that's like the basics. Uh, the, the more research that you have, the better, basic, which, I mean, should go without saying, but it's, it's really important in this game because you, get, you can get to the point where if you have higher research than your opponent, then you can start throwing out like crazy stuff that your opponent just doesn't have an answer to because they, they don't have enough, as much research as you do. I think a great example would be... Uh, Foul Vapors. Foul Vapors is... <laughs> it is a, uh, a game-changing spell. When you get access to Foul Vapors, your enemy needs to be prepared. So what this does is... If a fatigue, fatigue cost of 200, so you immediately knock yourself out when you cast this, unless you're much higher level than what it requires. And it requires two nature gems. Uh, we'll, we'll get into gems later. But basically, gems are the uh, resources that are required for casting certain spells that are particularly powerful. So, Foul Vapors just covers the entire battlefield in poisonous gas. And everyone will slowly start dying of poison. And I am not exaggerating when I say that this will kill everything on the battlefield given enough given enough time in fact this is one of those spells where a well-prepared mage by himself can encounter an enemy army and the enemy army can be thousands of troops strong and the mage will just cast this spell and everyone on the enemy t uh, enemy just everyone dies the entire enemy army is wiped out and I'm not exaggerating either. Well, okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Because um, if, if the enemy army can get to the mage and kill him, then this spell will end when the mage dies. But if you bring, like, a small defensive army to defend that mage as he casts this spell and 
just to get this spell up long enough for the poison damage to sink in, you can just wipe out entire enemy armies with this spell. And there are several spells like that, like uh, uh, Earthquake, for example, is a great, great, it's the quintessential anti-undead spell. So Earthquake just deals eight armor piercing damage to everything on the field that isn't flying or floating. Just everything takes eight armor piercing damage, which won't usually kill a human. I mean, it, it can't. It can. It, it certainly can, especially if the damage rolls high, because RNG is a thing. But this will just annihilate undead because undead have very low hit points, and uh, ah, it's nuts. And then there's like other stuff like firestorm. Yeah, firestorm just does what it says. A lot other stuff. That are, that's similar, like, uh, I would say, like, Wrathful Skies. Like, you call this in a storm, just lightning just starts striking all over the entire battlefield, and it just, it does so much damage. And shock damage is so hard to defend against. It, 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 it's completely, shock damage is armor negating. So it just completely ignores your protection. <clears throat> so magic in this game is nuts. Um... <laughs> I kind of want to just keep showing you just crazy, crazy stuff that you can do. Like you can summon, like, demon lords. Like, literally, Father Ill Earth. Like, th there are unique monsters in this game where once you summon them, nobody else can summon them because there's only one. And they're just incredibly powerful. And you could do th uh, just, yeah bind demon lord here there's, there's like nine demon lords and once they're all summoned you can't summon anymore uh magic and dominions is amazing so there are certain thresholds that once you reach them you suddenly gain a gain a power spike that you can immediately press to your advantage by attacking your enemy before they're ready one of the big ones is uh, Conjuration 5. Conjuration 5 unlocks the big boy elemental summons. So you can summon fire elementals, air elementals, water elementals, and earth elementals. All those elementals. And they are scary. They are used in combat for, from pretty much like the early game all the way to like the start of the end game. And even in the end game, if you can manage to buff up your elementals a little bit they are still terrifying speaking of buffs alteration let's look at some cool alteration spells um i personally like uh army of gold and army of lead these enchant all friendly units on the battlefield with lead skin or golden skin and it grants natural protection 20. Um, that's a lot. That is like the equivalent of full s steel plate in this game. Like black steel plate, which is like plate except steel, except even better. And not only that, not only is that basically equivalent of full plate armor, that also stacks with the armor you're already wearing. So if you're wearing armor that gives you like 10 protection and then you get this cast on you you have 30 protection <laughs> nothing mundane is getting through that unless like you're fighting giants or huge monsters or something so it's there's the whole game is full of just insane stuff like that like fog warriors for example this just turns your, your entire army into like mist form and they they inst all damage that they take is reduced to one <laughs> unless they're being attacked by magic weapons so if you don't have magic weapons and the enemy casts fog warriors you're screwed you're just completely screwed there's no way you're killing the, hit that army i mean there are there are lesser versions of these at lower levels but those are the ones those are the versions that affect your entire army and that's that's big stuff okay <clears throat> I'm going to stop gushing about the kind of magic that you can cast. Um, I'm sure you'll see some of it later in the game. Um, we are going to uh, talk a little bit about pretender design now.
or I guess more than a little bit. We're going to go over it. Uh, oh, yeah. These are the various magic paths, by the way. Um, fire, air, water, and earth are the elemental paths. And then astral, death, nature, and blood are the sorcery paths. And they're distinct in a few ways, but they're fairly self-explanatory, I'd say, except for like... Uh, astral might be, need a little bit of explanation. But you're going to be getting plenty of that because we're going to be playing Early Age Relay, which is an astral nation, primarily. <sighs> okay, so let's get talk about the pretenders. So when you play this game, you take the role of a pretender god. And this is the pretender selection screen. Now, these are not all the pretenders. In fact, this is a pretty slim selection of pretenders. Um, but the what pretenders that you can pick is determined by what nation you are playing. Now, we are playing Early Age Relay, so we get lots of ocean-based pretenders, which aren't the best, but there are some standout ones. And we're going to go over the various types of pretend, pretender chassis. chassis. Um, just kind of give you an idea of what they're for. <clears throat> okay, so the Dominion 1 pretenders are your rainbow chassis. Now what that means is these guys are very unimpressive as far as their stats. Like you, you can choose the uh, Grand Hydromancer here. and He's got like human, normal human stats. Like the only thing that's really stand out here is his morale and his magic resistance but pretty much all all pretenders get at least this high in both of those things but the standout thing here is the new magic cost new magic paths cost 10 so what that means is here i'm, I'm gonna go ahead and pick him so every every chassis has magic paths that it starts with naturally like Master of the Deep starts with uh, air and water. Uh, the Kraken starts with astral and nature and all of that. And in order to get new ones, you have to pay certain amounts of design points. Now your design points is basically everything on this screen costs design points, uh, leveling up your magic and changing your dominion scales. Uh, your dominion scales can also give you points if you decide to take uh, negatives but we'll get into that later but for the rainbow chassis down here um, getting new magic paths is very cheap so the reason why they're called rainbow is you can do this and you can just take all of them <laughs> so nothing in any other tier can do anything like this i mean it can but you'd have to pay out the ass for it so that's what they're for and, you know, they've got, like, a few differences between them. This dude's riding a lobster. He's a master ritualist. You know, he's this dude's riding an undead snapping turtle. Oh, and he's a lich, too, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay, anyway. The Dominion 2 chassis are your monsters. These are your big, scary monsters that have awesome stats. Just base. You don't. They don't need to be wearing, you know, magic items or anything. Oh god, I didn't talk about magic items. Uh, okay, we need to talk about magic items real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so, magic items. Another huge thing in this game. Magic items make a massive difference. If Again, if you've played Dungeons & Dragons, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm not exaggerating when I say, it's like that. It, the, the difference between not having magic items and having magic items is like the same as your D, &D character having magic items or not like they make a big difference and these are your magic item slots so the slave prince here has the standard set he can have a, a weapon a shield or he just has two hand slots a helmet slot a chest slot a boot slot and two uh, miscellaneous item slots and magic items are are nuts <laughs> they're not quite as crazy as spells but 
there's a thing in this game called thugging and thug there's a concept in this game called thugs and super combatants and basically what that means is you take a guy like this the slave prince who's i mean he's pretty impressive he's got 21 protection you know some cool stuff but if you give this guy a, just like a few magic items suddenly he becomes terrifying and he can take on like small enemy armies by himself like you you give him a flaming or or frost brand that hits like an entire square every time it attacks and you give him some he already has great armor so he doesn't really need that but just give him a few like boosts and suddenly you can raid with him like you can send him into enemy provinces that are undefended or, or relatively undefended and he can just take them by himself now the idea of super combatants is a little different <laughs> super combatants we don't have anyone who can really do that but a super combatant is a thug on steroids basically there are some th mages in this game let's, let's see if we can find one uh let's see atlantis this thing for example this thing has good stats lots of health and he's also a crazy powerful mage now if you take a crazy powerful mage with good stats and then you put a bunch of crazy powerful magic items on him now you're combining the crazy powerful magic items with crazy powerful spells and suddenly this guy can take on entire armies by himself and that happens all the time like you can you can do that like one of the fire spells in this game is called phoenix pyre and it basically it's it's not even that hard to get but it basically means whenever you die you just explode and you're immediately instantly reborn from the ashes with all of your stuff like you don't lose any of your buffs or anything either like you're still good to go you just you just gain some fatigue so you can imagine this guy all buffed up with awesome magic items he's got crazy buffs on him too like you, he's casted like quicken on himself so he moves twice as fast and he's ethereal and he's he's like got liquid shape so he's resistant to all kinds of damage because he's like half water and he's got phoenix pyre on him you know <laughs> even if you manage to kill him he just instantly revives and he's just he's got two weapons both of which like have aoe damage attacks like you could just slaughter enemy armies with these things and you have to literally design like an anti-super combatant thug in order to stop him or like have specific spells that are just prepared to stop him like he even comes with like cold resistance and fire resistance so you can't just blast him with fire or cold spells he doesn't you know <laughs> That's what a super combatant does. Okay, a uh, little detour there. Sorry about that. Anyway, back to uh, monster chassis. So these are the chassis that come right out of the box, ready to fight, is how I would describe them. They they need might need a little bit of help from like some magic spells, but that's it in fact they often don't even have magic slots so you couldn't equip them with armor or anything even if you wanted to you just you cast some buff spells on themselves and then you send them out to just fight that's what the monsters are there for and they're there specifically i would say for a concept called uh an awake expander so in this game man pretender design is a lot more complicated than i just kind of I don't know. I'm, all this is so ingrained in my head. I just never really thought about how complicated this is. Okay. So there's a concept called imprisonment. And this determines when, you're, um, when you can use your god. If your god is awake, then you can use him immediately at the start of the game. Like he's just in your capital ready to go. If he's dormant, then it will take one year give or take a month or two which is 12 turns um for your god to awaken and then you can use them if you go imprisoned 
then it'll take three years. And like it says, it gives you design points if you choose either of the uh, imprisoned or dormant options. So if you're choosing a monster chassis, you want to go awake because that's what they're for. Because unfortunately, the monster things don't really scale that well like they're useful from the early game to you know maybe halfway through the par partially into the mid game but once you're fully into the mid game like your enemies are not going to be too afraid of these things because they're going to have you know thugs and super combatants of their own who are going to be more than a match for these you know big monsters but the main purpose is to have something that you can use in the early game which is very important because there are a lot of nations in this game that do not have a strong early game at all and they definitely need the help <clears throat> particularly in a phase of the game called expansion which is one of the most important parts of the game at the very start of the game what you're going to be focusing on is just expanding as in making your nation bigger capturing territory spreading yourself out trying to take as much territory as you can before all the all the provinces are taken by other nations so basically it's establishing your initial foothold in the game and it's really really important because once all of the the world is claimed getting more of it is difficult because it means you have to go to war and if you go to war with someone to take territory and that person you're going to war with has more territory than you then they're going to have more to work with they're going to have a bigger empire they're going to have more money they're going to have more resources more just more of everything basically so the initial expansion phase of the game is very important and having a big monster who can go and take those initial provinces for you is very important and during during the expansion phase I should mention when you're taking unclaimed territory they're not undefended there are what's called independent forces there like you might be like you might want to take a nearby forest you will be like okay I want to take this forest and then you go there but there's a bunch of barbarians that already live in that forest and they don't you know they don't feel like serving you so you have to defeat them first um you, you'll learn more about that uh when we actually start playing the game anyway uh that is what these are for and you know a great example of an expander would be like the earth serpent the quintessential expander he has been around for a very long time um you might have noticed this game is called Dominions 5. There's been five of these. The Earth Serpent has always been good at expanding. He's just, he's got a boatload of protection. He's an Earth Mage, and Earth Magic's really good for initial expansion. He's amphibious, so he can go, he can take water provinces or land provinces. He's got fear, so nobody's going to stick around to fight him for very long. He's... Yeah, you know he's got recuperation so he heals from battle wounds um well okay i'm actually using a mod where every god has recuperation but in vanilla um, he's one of the few that actually does have it he's disease resistant he's affliction resistant he can see in the dark you know he can do all this stuff he's just perfect for expansion and nothing else so another thing i should mention the monsters are very bad mages they're not good at it you'll notice the new magic paths for them cost 80 points they are the least diverse mages in the game uh, as from all out of all the pretenders and that's because they're not supposed to be very versatile mages they have a very specific purpose they are designed to help you expand and to put pressure on uh, enemy nations who feel like starting an early war where you know they, they'll help they help defend you from rushes they help you rush your opponents that's what they're for okay now dominion three this these chassis are what are known as titans and that is because they tend to be big expensive 
humanoid looking things now we don't have a whole lot of super humanoid looking things because we're you know underwater relay but the big thing i i would say the uh the defining trait of titans is greed if you are taking a titan you are being greedy <laughs> for several reasons uh a titan a titan is expensive first and foremost like there's none of these are below like 200 design points in cost and but they have so many benefits like look like they have diverse paths they can get new paths that aren't not too expensively i mean it's okay it's, it's pretty expensive but they usually come with a bunch they're usually extremely powerful they have magic slots like oh imagine imagine decking this thing out with like crazy powerful magic items like imagine like you call like the recruitable super combatant strong think of one that's a god and gods have like way more hp than any other thing in the game <laughs> so just imagine decking one of these out and these are like incredibly powerful they're useful all the way into the late game and but they're just so expensive <clears throat> And that means you're not spending it that that money on other things you know and you, you need scales a lot of the times or you need high magic pads you need bless effects and stuff oh boy i gotta get into blesses too Whew, I, I gotta wrap this up okay i mean like there are exceptions to the whole greed concept like some of these I, I, another thing i should mention is most of these cannot expand well because they don't have high enough protection for the most part usually uh, like this guy's got protection 10 uh this guy can't expand this guy definitely can expand <laughs> I, I know from experience um i mean look at all these attacks he's he's crazy but yeah um titans the probably the least used category because they're they're hard to squeeze into what you want to do like it all whenever you're doing something like you're you've got a plan you, you, it's always difficult to find a titan that fits your points budget um okay we're gonna move on to immobiles now so immobiles are kind of uh i would say the they're the bless option if you want a particularly strong incarnate bless you're probably going with an immobile now you don't know what a bless is <laughs> so we're gonna get into that but the defining feature of immobiles is one they generally can't move they're stuck in your capital and they usually don't have any magic slots they're just there to have whatever magic paths they have they can cast rituals they can make items but their defining feature is a lot of them start with high magic paths in certain paths of magic or have diverse paths and aren't too expensive you know so let's get into blesses yeah uh okay let's let's pick one of these immobiles here like uh let's go with this thing right so you can level up the magic paths of your god however you want by spending points and when you reach a certain threshold that being level four in a path of magic you gain bless points of that path now what does this mean well okay let me tell you about sacred units so every nation or almost virtually every nation has certain units that are sacred so for us the gibbodai is sacred and the abodai is sacred <coughs> for example and what this means is that means that these are have religious significance in the culture of our nation and that means that they can be blessed now bless is a spell basically that can be cast only by priests 
So this is a slave priest. He is a level one priest, which means that he can cast bless. Now, what does bless do? Well, that's what bless effects do. So basically, whenever uh, a priest casts a blessing on a sacred unit, that sacred unit gains any bless effect that you add to it. So let's look at what bless effects we have at our disposal. These are the nature bless effects. Resilience, uh, which just gives them more HP. Low light vision, that gives them like 50% dark vision. Poison resistance, unaging, berserker, recuperation, bark skin, regen. Regen is a very, um, is a very popular bless. And basically what it does is it makes the blessed sacred unit regenerate 10% of its, H of its HP every turn. That's very strong, uh, especially on things that have high hit points. So lots of giant nations, like nations that command giants who have lots of hit points, like to use regeneration. Like, for example, we have pretty high hit points. We've got... Uh, our sacred mage here has 50 hit points. So if he had regeneration uh, bless placed on him, he'd be regaining five HP every turn. That's pretty cool. Now it's not definitely not useful to us, but uh, <laughs> that's something you can do. And the cool part of pretender design is combining these effects. Like a really popular one would be, or not, maybe not popular, but something you could do would be to combine regeneration and hard skin now hard skin gives you plus five natural protection and that stacks with any natural protection that you have naturally so if you have something that has like 15 natural protection and you put the hard skin bless on it ooh, he's got 20 natural protection now that's that's pretty scary especially if he's got a ton of hp and he's regenerating too so designing your god around your sacred units is definitely a viable strategy and in fact a lot of nations revolve around bless effects and their powerful sacreds and the, the crazy buffs that you can give them with bless effects <clears throat> now our nation ea relay is not one of them at all <laughs> we don't care about blesses at all our sacred units are not very powerful or we're barely going to be using them really aside from the uh the um sacred mage i'm quite fond of them but yeah we're not going to be going for any crazy bless effect our nation has lots of other cool stuff that it can do and the god that i'm going to be per personally choosing is the floating mind who is a giant massive huge jellyfish who's skilled in astral and water magic. And I'm going to do something stupid and not optimal, and I'm gonna give him uh, just, just a bunch of different paths. <laughs> Definitely don't recommend doing this. I'm, I'm using like, what, 160 points just to give him earth and air magic. Um, but we'll get into why later. But uh, we need to discuss scales next. Now, scales and dominion are another thing that you can spend your points on or gain points from. And there's a bunch of different ones and they all have different effects. But first off, we need to uh, talk about dominion. So if you've ever played a civilization game, dominion is like culture. You know how your culture spreads uh, like throughout your territory and it can extend into enemy territory or enemy culture can you know spread into your territory? That's what Dominion is, kind of. Basically, it represents the influence of your god and your religion and its power. So the higher the Dominion strength, the easier and faster your Dominion will spread over the land. And you can help it along with like priests and preaching and temples and you know having an awake god for example helps a lot because your god itself spreads dominion because i mean having an incarnate god is uh well it's bound to sway a few hearts and minds if you know what i mean 
Oh, sh- right, incarnate. Yeah, so if you might have noticed that there are certain bless effects that say incarnate only, that means that this bless effect doesn't work unless your god is alive and present. Uh, alive meaning they're not dead, because your your gods can die. And they're, they're not dead permanently, you can revive them. But if your god is dead, then your incarnate uh, blesses will not work. And present meaning they're not imprisoned. So if you take an incarnate bless and you go imprisoned, that your, your bless isn't going to work until your your uh, god is actually on the map. You can also be your gods can also be like banished to like the underworld or something, which is but that that's really rare. Anyway, <clears throat> Ugh, I keep going off on scattering all over the place in this video. I hope I hope I'm not losing you. Anyway. That's what Dominion does. And your Dominion scales are the effects that your Dominion has on the world. So if you are, if, if, if an, a province is affected by your Dominion, like it's under your Dominion, then your scales will slowly be applied to that province. And what your scales do, well, they do various things. Uh, order slash turmoil so you can all all of these go up to th- plus three or minus three so if you go plus three of plus in order you will gain income you will reduce un- unrest you will gain more recruitment points so you can train more troops uh you will gain a little bit of resource x bonus resources and the number of random events that you will have will decrease because it's it's very orderly not crazy things don't happen if you go into turmoil, then the exact opposite happens, and you gain points for going into negative scales. See, I, I'm gaining and losing scales as I change this. Uh, production uh, increases income a little bit, but mainly gives you resources. So you'll have lots of resources in order to equip your troops. Now this matters. These two scales are quite important or unimportant, depending on what nation that you are playing now there are some nations that you know equip all their troops with like powerful weapons and armor and they need tons of resources so they'll they'll go with high production or like for us for example uh, we most of our guys are like naked like this dude two resources this thing one resource this thing one resource one resource, Lobo Guard, one resource. Like, we don't care much that much about resources. We've got a few that do, like this one, but it's only 11. That's like com- totally average. That's like an average soldier amount of resources. The only thing that we have that takes a ton of resources is this guy. And he's got like, you know, an, a hauberk and helmet and a shield and a sword. And he requires 22. So it's a shame that if we, if we, we can usually pretty much drop production and go into sloth instead <clears throat> and that will give us more points to work with and this is temperature scales so unlike the other scales going in either direction on this one is negative and it gives you points so you can either go cold or heat and they both have the same effect but there's a few other minor effects that they do as well like, for example, there are certain uh, things in this game that are cold-blooded. So if they go into cold scales, then uh, they get negatives to their encumbrance. But uh, they're pretty niche. We're not going to go into it that much right now. But I would generally recommend... It's usually a, f- a fine idea to just go to three in either direction. Temperature scales aren't the end of the world. And there are also seasons in this game, like there's winter and summer. And in those seasons, the effects of whatever you uh, heat scale you chose is going to be diminished anyway. So it's really not that big of a deal. And we're an underwater nation, so we care even less because temperature scales are like, they barely affect underwater nations at all. So we're going to go cold because there are certain cold spells, uh, certain water spells um that are boosted in cold dominion and we're very powerful in water magic we've got uh these guys can be up to water magic three 
these guys start at water three and they can go up to water four or even five if we're super lucky yeah we've got lots of water mages so cold good for us uh growth and death uh these are extremely important um if you're not playing an undead nation never ever ever go death it's really really bad um so what death does is it makes the population of your provinces slowly die off and the amount of income that a province is worth uh, generates every turn is largely based on its population so if you take death what that means is you're slowly going to be making less and less money the longer the game goes on until eventually everything in your dominion is just dead and will make zero money at all so as you can imagine that's really bad <laughs> you don't want that uh so th but i mean the importance of growth and death really depends on how long the game is going to last um if you think that the the game is going to last like up, up to like you know beyond 50 turns and it probably will uh growth is really 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 important it, it makes it so that your income scales with the size of your um of your nation and you're going to be constantly recruiting new mages to re like research and stuff so you really need the amount of money that you're making to be constantly going up in order to support all of the stuff that you're buying all the time um generally i'm just i'm gonna make just a general recommendation here go growth go growth three just pretty much always go growth three uh if you really want to you can drop it down but you want to be growing you definitely want to be growing growth three do it uh luck luck is the most controversial of all uh scales P some people love it some people hate it some people think it's no big deal to take misfortune they say it's free points some people absolutely despise misfortune they say you're fucking crazy if you take it uh so one thing one thing that i will tell you do not take misfortune three just 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 trust me on this don't do it <laughs> i don't i don't have any evidence to support this but don't take don't take misfortune misfortune three it's really bad you, you'll have a bad time if you take misfortune three uh you can take misfortune one it'll be unpleasant sometimes your pop your you know provinces will get nasty events that reduce the amount of income that they make or have terrible migrations or things you can take misfortune two uh things will be worse you'll be you'll be getting a lot of events that are not so great for you but you you can live with it i've lived with it before it's not terrible it's it's pretty bad but it's not it's not terrible um luck is <sighs> i'm not a huge fan of luck personally some people are uh, i think I've, there, I've seen some like some studies that say that luck is definitely worth it in the long run in fact some people say that you make more doing luck than you do going order three which just increases like your income by quite a bit but i don't know i don't like it uh sometimes it makes the early game kind of a, a just a you're flipping a coin <laughs> you know if you if you decide to go like turmoil three and luck three and you're just kind of relying on luck for you to, to get you money sometimes you're gonna have a really bad time in the early game because you need money in the early game money is the most important factor in the early game when you're setting up your infrastructure and expanding and stuff and i like i just like it to be a little more reliable and lastly is magic and drain so <clears throat> immediate effect that magic has is it increases the amount of research points that all of your mages have and this this adds up this adds up a lot um if you have magic three you're going to be researching significantly faster than someone who doesn't have magic and this scales the more researchers you have 
the more magic three is going to affect your research. Magic's really good. Not only that, but the higher magic skills you have, the easier it is to cast magic. Like you actually, you don't take as much fatigue as you would if you were casting in neutral skills when you cast magic. Drain is the opposite. More fatigue when you cast spells, less research. Never go drain. <laughs> that's that's not true. Some nations can go drain, but we definitely aren't. In fact, we want magic. We are very research dependent. Our the particular nation that we're playing right now loves research. So we're gonna take that. Um, okay. I believe this is the pretender that we're going to be going with, these stats here. And uh, I'll go into why later, uh, in detail anyway. But suffice to say, uh, there are some certain specific spells that I want to be casting with these. Um, with these, And uh, uh, some special items that I want to craft as well. And this will give me, I think just enough ma uh, money to expand properly and we we don't nearly need uh, production like I said but this will give me about what I need actually you know I'm gonna I want I'll have neutral order and one sloth because I, I kind of want to I kind of want to recruit a few of these guys I think they're cool uh, anyway I think that's all I need to cover we will talk about our god uh, what he's going to be doing for us in the expansion phase in the next video. And he is going to be awake, so we're going to have this big jellyfish helping us out uh, in our initial phase of the game. Uh, okay, so that's that's all the prep done. Now we can finally actually play the game. <laughs> I, um, I hope you stuck around this long. I kind of doubt it. But um, yeah, we're going to be moving on now. Oh, right, our Bless effect. Uh, we want Arcane Finesse. So what Arcane Finesse does is it gives us plus one magic penetration. So basically, we get plus one to our roll to overcome enemy magic resistance. That's good for us. There's lots of things that, that can do for us. And with our last two points, we're going to take the only things that are available to us. Minor magic resistance, so we're a little better at resisting. And Arcane Command, so we can command more magical troops we don't need that but it's the only thing left uh okay that's everything this video is dragging on for way longer than i intended but yeah i hope you learned something <laughs>